In the early days of my Christian faith in undergrad and grad school, one constant in every church I attended, in every campus ministry group I was a part of, and every Bible study I went to was the proliferation of the message that the world, meaning everything and everyone outside of our Christian faith, was broken. Non-Christians, or even Christians that weren't sold on the idea that nothing positive could be gained from the world, were spiritually dying in a state of confusion and were broken people in need of a savior. It was this ideology that led me just to get up one Saturday morning and walk over to see the warehouse across from campus one day and sell my juvenile M&M and DMX CDs, among several others, I'm sure. What the hell was I thinking? We as Bible-believing Christians had the answers. And a hallmark of this mindset is the view that moral relativism is the enemy. But now that Donald Trump is president of the United States, and many conservative Christians are devoted to him, we get standard bearers like Rudy Giuliani saying this on Meet the Press. You believe this is on them, that you would have, that, that you guys have not delayed the interviewing, uh, no. delayed the negotiations. Yeah, from yes, Mueller. each time by three or four days so we could write a letter in response. They have taken two to three weeks to get back to us. So I, what I have to tell you is, look, I'm not gonna be rushed into having him testify so that he gets trapped into perjury. And when you tell me that, you know, he should testify because he's going to tell the truth and he shouldn't worry. Well, that's so silly because it's somebody's version of the truth, not the truth. He didn't have a, a conversation. Truth is about, truth. I, I don't mean to go like. I, no, I it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. The president of the United States says I didn't. Truth is a I, truth. Mr. Mayor, do you realize what I, I, I no, I, no, th no. This is going to become a bad don't, 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 do, don't, do, don't do this to me. Don't do truth uh, is Donald a truth Trump, to me. Donald Trump says, I didn't talk about Flynn with Comey. Comey says, you did talk about it. So tell me what the truth is. Don McGahn might uh, If know. you're such a genius, John McGahn, Don McGahn doesn't know. If that's the situation, okay. they have two pieces of evidence. Trump says, I didn't tell him. And the other guy says that he did say it, which is the truth. And you're, well, I mean, maybe point, you you're know right. because you're, you're a genius. Under two people, I know you're right. I don't read minds on that front. Let me ask so you this have, final we question. Have, no, 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 no. Let me finish. We have a credibility gap between the two of them. You've got to select one or the other. Now, who do you think Mueller's going to select? One of his best friends, uh, Comey, or the president who he has been carrying on a completely wild, crazy, is it possible, unorthodox investigation? Is it possible he makes a conclusion based on who's been more truthful over the years? It's possible that he'll make the conclusion on which of the two statements is more logical, which of the two statements has more common sense. Yeah, it's possible he can do that. The funny thing is, the quote is very similar to a quote in the Bible. What is truth? And this came from the man who sentenced Jesus Christ to die, Pontius Pilate. When we view the world and engage with it based not on observable facts, and history and reason, logic and outcomes, and instead engage based on identity, the truth recedes to the background, even for those who make the most vigorous claims that truth matters. I'm your host, Jay Poole, and this is Potstirer Podcast. Ever since Donald Trump was elected president, there have been a lot of people, regular folks and seasoned political observers alike, both outside the country and stateside, wondering how did we end up with Donald Trump? How did we get to the point where we have a man in the White House who shamelessly violates the unwritten rules of public discourse and behavior every single day? And even with contradictions that have been recorded coming out of his own mouth, all of the lies, he maintains a dedicated core of supporters who are willing to set aside the values they claim to live by to support him. Does truth matter anymore? I've been thinking about this for a while. There was a time, mainly back when I was in college, when I could engage in reasoned discussion with people who disagreed with me politically 
And at the end of the day, we didn't see each other any differently. But those times are all but over. Many of us automatically think the worst of each other while ignoring or defending the problematic words and actions from those we find ourselves loyal to. In America, we have become a culture of us and them thoughts, discourse, and behavior. We have become a nation of demagogues. For this episode, I'm drawing quite a bit from a really good book called Demagoguery and Democracy by Patricia Roberts Miller. It's a short read, and even though it's an academic text, it's written in a way that it's fairly easy for the general public to digest. It's a nonpartisan overview of how demagoguery can take hold in a society, and it's not necessarily dependent on a specific political ideology. So yes, under the right circumstances, progressives can fall for demagogues too. Demagoguery refers to discourse that focuses on identity rather than reason. In other words, using an us-versus-them framework to engage with society and politics. When many of us think of a demagogue, we think of a charismatic leader who uses divisive rhetoric to hold sway over their supporters, someone who taps into the core of people's identity and frames the world as a battle between the good guys, us, and the bad guys, them. Because the demagogue is tapping into something that is particularly important to people, some aspect of who they are, they feel emotionally compelled to follow the demagogue. It doesn't matter what the demagogue does, grab by the pussy, says, both sides, or advocates. Knock the crap out of them, would you? Seriously. Where the demagogue goes, their believers follow. I don't know why you hate us. Why do you hate us? Because we're Mexicans? We're honest people right here. <laughs> Rapists? How many people have I raped? How many, pe- how many drugs have I dealt? Huh? Oh, yeah? You believe everything you see on the news? You see how we're working hard right here? Okay, people are doing it. We're also pulling it in everybody else's yard. And if we are to consider our current president a demagogue, We can look at the rash of viral videos lately where mostly Caucasian individuals have called the police on people of color for living their everyday lives or have verbally assaulted strangers on the street, emboldened by the words and actions of the leader of the free world. If we have a demagogue leading our country, our democracy is in danger. And I'll explain why in a minute. Robert Smiller makes the argument that demagoguery doesn't start with the demagogue but with society itself. She says, quote, demagoguery isn't about what politicians do. It's about how we as citizens argue, reason, and vote, unquote. The proliferation of demagoguery and discourse within a society makes it susceptible to leaders who are demagogues. In the book, Robert Smiller notes that democracies succeed when certain structural and rhetorical conditions are in place. Structurally, democracies thrive when society has a strong middle class, police and military are independent of each other and under civilian control, due process applies to all groups, government has respect for privacy under most conditions, and citizens are upset if politicians are unfair or untruthful, regardless of whose side these politicians are on. Rhetorically, democracies succeed when public discourse favors fairness, inclusion, self-skepticism, responsibility, and the ability to zero in on the core of issue disagreements. That last part, which Robert Miller calls stasis, stasis is the singular, the idea of stasis is actually super important. So for example, I think of the conversations I've had with Michaela and John from Otters Talking Politics, which is a great political podcast that comes from a more libertarian perspective. When we've debated issues, we all feel strongly about the issues we've discussed. But when we've gotten down to it, the core of where we disagree tends to center on the role of government, which we see very differently. And understanding that this is the stasis 
It allows for us to understand each other's points of view better, helps us to better speak to where we stand ourselves, and we can walk away from the discussion continuing to respect each other. And I think that part can't be overstated. For democracy to do well, we need to be able to hold different points of view and be able to disagree while still viewing each other as fellow members of society worthy of respect. When we discuss issues based on the values of fairness, inclusion, responsibility, self-skepticism, and stasis, we're including everyone in the discussion, if at all possible, and looking at the facts, the history, the practicality, and the long view, including unintended consequences. Reasoned discussion from the stakeholders, because we don't live in a vacuum. Political decisions can affect a lot of people. But when members of society deliberate political issues based on identity, or in other words, in a demagogic way, not everyone is invited to the discussion. Only we are. Because They are not just people who have different views on issues. Oh, no. They are the enemy. They are the danger. It would be harmful, suicidal even, to empathize with them, to treat them the way we would want to be treated. And this is what places democracy in danger. Because democracy requires we rule by majority while preserving the rights of the minority. This is why we have representative government and we have the courts. But if we are ruled through discourse that makes it preferable or even necessary to view and then treat chunks of our society as the enemy based solely on identity, democracy dies. So I'm a huge fan of the First Amendment, particularly the right to free speech. We should be able to share our opinions in the public square without retribution from the government. This even extends to people I disagree with the most, and even people whose ideas can be considered dangerous, such as the views of race warriors and religious extremists. If the government suppresses views we don't agree with, we give these ideas more power, adding a touch of martyrdom to their adherents who are punished by government. It can also endanger our own ideas, if at some point people like ourselves are no longer in power. In a functioning democratic society, we should be able to consider and discuss political and social ideas using reason, facts, and logic. We should be able to vote and engage politically using vetted information, critical thinking, and a bit of perspective. But for free speech to coexist with a functional democracy, we must be willing to do our civic duty and learn about these issues and be willing to engage each other in honest, fact-based dialogue. I always close out each show by stating, freedom is not free. When we think on this statement, when we marinate on this statement, we think of the men and women who serve and put their lives on the line for our country and its ideals. And that's super important, but it's more than that. Freedom requires us to make the effort to understand our country and its people and to engage with ideas and others. Freedom requires that we put in the work. Identity is important in the sense that it's often what drives our personal experiences, but we need to understand that our experiences are subjective, meaning that your experiences are not necessarily generalizable to everyone, and your experiences don't trump someone else's. At the end of the day, We are all born, we all live, and we all die. We all have the capacity to think, to feel, to act. We are all equal at our core. The Declaration of Independence states that all men are created equal. And while in practice, the Founding Fathers didn't really mean that. After all, these were men of great wealth, many of whom owned slaves and were driving Native Americans off their land. But the ideal is important because it matters for a republic based on democratic values. To foster these democratic values is hard. Knowing what we personally go through is easy, but listening to and empathizing with the experiences of others is hard. We have to put in the work. 
But what if we don't put in the work? Robert Miller says this, quote, Demagoguery says we don't have to debate policies since what we should do is empower good people or a good person to do what every good person recognizes to be the obviously right course of action. We need to stop thinking and debating and just act, unquote. She later makes this point, quote, Charismatic leadership satisfies our desire to be part of something bigger and, paradoxically, to hand all power over to someone else can make us feel more powerful because we think that person is a best version of ourselves. We feel that we have gained agency by proxy, unquote. It is all too easy to reflect on our background and our personal experiences and see ourselves as sympathetic characters. We begin believing we are better and our experiences matter more and our lives matter more. Life becomes a zero-sum game because if I'm better, I'm owed more, I deserve more. And them? What about them? Why should I care about them? Anything they get is what I could have had. And so they're taking from me. And that is a threat to me. Their actions threaten me. Their words threaten me. Their existence threatens me. And as part of the fact that I'm better than them, I begin to fear them. Because if they were in my place, they would do to me what I'm doing to them. So I can't let that happen. I have to be ready. How can I keep that from happening? How can I keep from letting that happen? Fear rules. Facts no longer matter. Truth no longer matters. We become vulnerable to those who will exploit and weaponize our feelings of superiority and fear for their own benefit. And we thank them for it. Because freedom is hard. Following a leader that speaks to my experiences, my identity, the things I'm afraid of, a leader that will give me comfort and protection, that's easy. It gives me an escape from the hard work that freedom and functional democracy require. I think there are a couple of reasons why the U.S. has slid towards demagoguery, or really authoritarianism by demagogue. Unwillingness to invest in our own people, in the work of thought leaders who have used the rhetoric of blame and fear to capitalize on major social changes. I've talked about at length in previous episodes the idea that we should have nationalized health care because people's health and lives should not depend on what jobs they have or how much money they make. Lives have intrinsic worth, which runs counter to privatized health care. Private companies, especially for-profit companies, have the maximizing of profit as their core goal. And in most industries, that's fine. It's not a problem. But in health care, Spending money on preventing people from getting sick or treating people if they are sick means cutting into profits. So, left to their own devices, private companies will work to maximize profits. The insurance companies will do their best to keep from spending money, which is at odds with keeping people well and treating the sick. That is why the entire insurance model of healthcare simply doesn't work. But we need to look at not only health care, but also education as ways that government can invest in our own people. We should invest more in public education at all levels rather than work to destroy it or privatize everything so that only those who are well-off can access it. In addition, we should be willing to invest in labor. From mandated paid maternity and paternity leave to time off to raising the minimum wage to a living wage and other legal protections so that labor is not exploited and that people's time is given proper value. Remember, we all have intrinsic worth. That means our time is important. Our time is valuable. Because as a country, when we invest in our own people, more of our people are in the position to contribute their best to society, to do what they are most talented to do, what they are called to do, and participate more fully in our democracy. But as it is, so many people are struggling to make ends meet 
working hard to pay off expensive medical debt and student loans and other debts, getting sick and worrying about what burden that will put on their families. The things we worry about as Americans, we're too busy to pay attention to what's really going on in our own country, to participate fully, and to critically think about what we are seeing, and to talk about it with people with different points of view, and to actually consider what they have to say. That takes energy, energy that so many of us don't have. And it's easier to consume the stuff that already feeds into how we view the world and each other. When we don't invest in our people, democracy suffers. What we see right now, a deeply divided society, is the result of years of divided politics. We've always had divided politics in a divided society to some degree. And at various times throughout American history, blame and scapegoating has been used for economic, social, and political gain. From slavery to Reconstruction in Jim Crow to labor disputes to the World War, so on and so forth. Scapegoating immigrants, scapegoating racial minorities, scapegoating women, scapegoating religious minorities, LGBT people, and people of specific ethnic backgrounds. The current political divides are largely based in conservative reactions to the social upheaval of the 1960s. Listen to my episode on compromise, I believe it's episode 8, if you'd like to hear more on that specifically. But long story short, the Southern strategy was careful rhetoric used to court disaffected Southern and working class whites by subtly scapegoating Black Americans and other groups who had been marginalized blaming them for any real or perceived suffering they may have been experiencing. It was developed during the late 1960s and through the 1970s and championed by guys like Harry Dent, Pat Buchanan, and Lee Atwater. And these strategies were adopted by third-way conservative Democrats, such as Bill Clinton in the 1990s, to distance himself and the Democratic Party from radicals and liberals to court the same target audience, disaffected white people, back to the Democratic Party. Slurs and epithets and crudeness, those are so mad men. They're so old school, so passe. We don't want to come off that way. Instead, let's talk inner cities and thugs, super predators, fatherless kids, welfare queens, broken families. We pay way too much in taxes and we would hate for our hard earned money to support takers and irresponsible people. We need stronger leadership that tells it like it is. We can't run things based on emotion and political correctness. We must stand for law and order. If you get caught with pot or crack, you should go to jail. It's illegal after all. But we gotta make sure that our sons and daughters who fall into drug addiction get the treatment they need. And we lock up those soulless monsters who supply our babies with these horrible drugs forever. We need to preserve religious freedom and protect the children from being indoctrinated. We need to preserve traditional marriage. We want to protect small business owners from radicals and activists. You know, everything was better when you could come home from work, kick your feet up, and a home-cooked dinner was ready. And the neighborhoods were kept up and you knew everybody and it wasn't so scary. We need to put America first preserve states' rights, and keep the symbols of our history alive. Heritage, not hate. And you know, we don't want American culture to disappear. The Southern strategy dovetailed with the rise of the religious right, which did attack women's agency in gender equality, but as I've mentioned in previous episodes, was built by guys like Paul Weirich and Jerry Falwell Sr., originally as a reaction to the federal government forcing segregation academies in the South to open their doors to people of color. But they later settled on the abortion issue, which didn't become the only issue that mattered to religious conservatives until the late 1970s, early 80s, years after Roe v. Wade. Here's the thing. The groundwork was being laid for Donald Trump long before he ran for president. He didn't start this. He's just an opportunist who reaps the benefits of decades of demagoguery in action. I am sure that many of us want a healthy, thriving democracy with fact-based, 
consistent discourse on the issues we face as a country. How do we do that in a country overrun by demagogues? We need to make sure we're understanding the issues and not resorting to demagoguery ourselves. And I think many of us do unconsciously fall into some of that. I'm sure I have. The thing is, democratic discourse includes fairness. Now, let me be clear. I'm not giving a we go high message. I'm not saying that all arguments are equal. I don't think that progressives should lie down and allow the right to own the narrative. But I think we need to be sure we're consistent regarding the facts, what we value as ideals, and what we value in leadership, regardless of who they are. Roberts Miller gives four strategies to address demagoguery and lead us back to democracy. Number one, we can work to reduce the profitability of demagoguery by consuming less of it ourselves and shaming media outlets that rely heavily on it. In other words, we need to change what we consume and call out the news sources we listen to who lean into it. As much as it might make us feel vindicated on the inside to read on HuffPo that we're the good guys, Republicans are all a bunch of hateful bigots, evil Trump ruined Obama's perfect presidency, and Hillary lost in 2016 simply because she's a woman. We need to do better. Number two, we can choose to try to persuade people who are repeating demagogic talking points while choosing not to get into arguments with them. By this, Roberts Miller means we should expose those engaged in demagoguery to members of the outgroup without arguing with them. She also makes this point here, quote, invite your interlocutor to meet them, point out the individuals who don't fit the stereotype, and if you are a member of their outgroup, then resist your interlocutor's desire to treat them as an exception, unquote. That last part, I think, is why I'm a little skeptical of this approach being viable. I've had these types of conversations before, generally as someone who is part of the outgroup in question, though not always. And probably nine times out of ten, the conversation is some version of, oh, I don't mean you, or, but you're different. You're not like them. And even if the discussion is about another group of people, sometimes I'll get, well, the people you know who are X are different. Or, oh, they're just deceiving you. So yeah, responses usually fall under either you're an exception or you're too dumb to know better. To be honest, this one might be a more successful strategy if you share the same in-group status as the person you're having the conversation with. Number three, or you might choose to argue with family, friends, or random people who are repeating demagogic talking points. Roberts Miller says that this is the most complicated strategy. It is in the sense that you wanna know what you're talking about, understand the logic of what the other person is stating, and you have to know how to argue without resorting to logical fallacies. But it's actually one I enjoy more than the others so far, because if done correctly, you can take apart the other's argument using questions, facts, and logic, and expose the flaws. You're probably not going to get your stubborn Uncle Bob to admit at Thanksgiving dinner the logical inconsistency in saying that Latino immigrants are mooching off the welfare rolls, and they are taking all these jobs away from white Americans. But it may plant a seed. And if others are listening, your arguments may lead them to rethink their attitudes. Keep in mind, this is a very long road strategy. And number four. Hence, the most important tactic is to support and argue for democratic deliberation. Before even having this conversation, make sure you all agree on the rules of conversation. Robert Miller goes in depth here about the idea of fairness. The rules of the game should apply to everyone equally. If, for example, a personal anecdote is considered proof for you, then if I use an anecdote, it carries the same weight. We need to be consistent, empathetic, and fair. These are individual level approaches, but I think these can be used to varying degrees at a higher level. To fix our slide into authoritarianism by demagogue, 
we have to resist becoming that way ourselves, take on demagogic discourse in a reasoned way, and guide each other towards a positive, inclusive way of engaging and interacting with each other. We need to do the work. Our democracy depends on it. Now, speaking of divisiveness, Divisive Issues is a very entertaining comics podcast on the Flying Machine Network. From the makers of Oops, I Talk Politics, Ryan, Phil, Daryl, and Sly talk comic history, characters, and more. Check out their most recent episode, Issue 74, where the phenomenal foursome talk about the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen Part 2 and its acclaimed author, Alan Moore. And somehow, Pokemon makes an appearance in the episode too. So I highly, highly encourage you to listen to Divisive Issues and subscribe because it's definitely one to satisfy the inner nerd in all of us. And if you're wondering, yeah, I do have an inner nerd. Divisive Issues is on iTunes, Stitcher, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts and visit their website, franzradio.com slash Divisive Issues. And you can check out Divisive Issues and all the other awesome shows of the Flying Machine Network on flyingmachine.network slash shows. Thanks so much for listening to Potstirer Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or on Android. Go on potstirerpodcast.com slash download and links are right there. If you subscribe, you can get new episodes once they drop so you don't have to wait. I want to hear from you. If you liked what you heard, please give us five stars and leave a review. And feel free to reach out on Twitter at PotstirrerCast to share what you think. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free. I give you the incredible flying machine.